Right, also breaking right now, leaders of a well-known motorcycle gang arrested on major federal charges, one right here in the Houston area. Once the kings of America's outlaw roads, the largest biker gang is now facing a fall from power, unlike anything seen before. For years, banditos ruled the roads and the cities, carving an empire that many a soul thought twice about contesting. However, recent events have brought this gang down to its knees as they have unearthed a criminal underbelly of betrayal and a ruthless effort by crime agencies. From their untouchable origins to their negligent demise, we explore the spiraling grip on the nation before ultimately revealing what the tale of the American Mafia has to offer for the future of organized crime in America. Chapter 1. The Formation and Expansion of Bandidos Outlaw motorcycle clubs have been in operation for a long time, and their formation has been attributed to the social structure that developed after the Second World War in America. Upon returning from war, many soldiers wanted to get back to the feel of battle and were unsatisfied with civilian jobs, so they formed motorcycle clubs to meet their needs. However, it became unclear when it was realized that not all these clubs were similar in a desirable way. Outlaw culture was a segment that roughly included one percenters who did not recognize the mainstream culture and its rules. Even the term one percenter originated from the American Motorcyclist Association, which said that 99% of riders were within the law while 1% were outlaws. This badge of defiance turned into a point of pride and led to the formation of future notorious cycles such as the Hells Angels, Mongols, and later the Bandidos. The Bandidos Motorcycle Club was formed in 1966 by the Vietnam War veteran Donald Mother Chambers, who saw the importance of loyalty and fellowship. Chambers, who was from San Leon, Texas, believed that the rest of society had little to offer a man like him, who wanted to lead an adventurous, rough, outlawed lifestyle. He dared to imagine a club that reflected this idea and included people who disliked it when standard norms were at play. Wanting to replicate the camaraderie of the Vietnam veterans team, Chambers started the Banditos with a set of predetermined values to include commitment and honor among others, meaning all Banditos for all, all are for one. Since its creation, the Banditos recruited hard-skinned men who vowed to follow the organization's rules and the club expanded significantly. Texas became their base of operation, but the Banditos spread throughout the southwestern part of the USA riding on their infamous policy, which was known as the deadly justice for each other. There was a fat, armed Mexican bandit on the local club emblem, and the team's motto was, we are the people our parents warned us about. To the members, the banditos were more than a club. They were a means of enjoying an existence that displayed the rejection of typical societal norms. With more members joining the banditos club, the club started growing to different parts of the world, including Europe, Australia, and Canada areas, among others. Their expansion trend correlated with the increase of biker subculture worldwide, and the Banditos became the epitome of the image of a tough, bike-wearing biker. This influence created an international biker culture associated with those who wanted freedom and a rebellious brotherhood. By the end of the 1970s, the Banditos had become a formidable presence in the OMCG world and was now on a par with the Hells Angels. Their presence became swift, but with growth attracted more attention. Police forces started paying a keen interest in the club, as that connection pointed toward the involvement in different criminal incidences. Some news stories and revelations were made, where the banditos were found to be involved in the drug business, sale of arms, and bona fide wars with other outlawed clubs. Nevertheless, the club grew even further and its international connections cemented its position as one of the major players in the biker community. These factors, their fast expansion, and the strict protection of the members' interests turned the Banditos into an iconic and sustainable part of the outlaw biker legend. This legend would face severe threats to its very existence. In the late 1960s and end of 1970s, the Banditos started to expand itself from the contours of Texas by moving to the other states whose populations the group considered rebellious or loyal to what the group stood for. Chambers and the club leadership knew that only such fast expansion would allow them to challenge the other dominant OMCs, especially the HAMC, which had already emerged nationally. 
With the opening of chapters in areas wherever existing motorcycle clubs already had a sizable following, the Bandidos were able to tap into a pool of bikers who were already schooled in the lifestyles, but wanted more visibility and clout, and who also had access to the necessary resources that would be important in holding their own against rival clubs. Recruitment was highly selective, and the Bandidos preferred members who already had military experience or men who had led violent, high-risk lives. They employed this strategy to establish a nucleus of highly committed fighters who possessed and came with tactical training and parade discipline, almost the characteristic of a paramilitary organization. To complement this, the club was supreme and had an unbreachable code of honor. Being responsible for a given club's operation was taken seriously to a level where members were supposed to declare their loyalty towards it, and the brothers were valued most. This loyalty was not an idle show, Defecting to the Bandidos was a capital offense as far as the outsiders were concerned, and any signs of betrayal were punished in the worst ways imaginable. Most of these involved significant physical violence. The club was also heavily engaged in what was referred to as turf wars, especially in the southwestern region of the United States, because competition with other OMCs was cutthroat. Most significantly, the Bandidos and the Hells Angels developed the best-known OMC enemy relationship, this rivalry was rather tendentious and often coupled with physical confrontation. Disputes involved controls, territories, and other conditions of cattle breeding, and becoming famous as a great warrior. In the 1980s and the 1990s, there were several confrontations between the Bandidos and other clubs that eventually led to biker brawls and deadly shootouts, which cemented the image of Bandidos as a gang that should not be messed with. To sustain this, the Bandidos ensured that the members were not just willing to go to war, but would also be capable and armed to do so in the club's interest. In the late 1980s, the Bandidos sought to expand their organization internationally because of the high status of the Hells Angels in the United States of America territory. This expansion started in Australia because of the increasing fascination with outlaw biker gangs, especially the Bandidos. Thanks to that and their willingness to apply the concept of so-called patching over, they spread across the country. The geographical expansion of the Bandidos continued in the following years through East Europe, including Germany, Denmark, and Sweden. And just like in America, it expanded through the association of charters, absorbing other biking organizations in the regions. While the international expansion was an outgoing process with the simple objective of increasing the sphere of influence of the club, it was also a method of creating new opportunities for criminal activity. Over time, as the Bandidos expanded their organization, their chapters in several countries helped them lay down a criminal conduct network. Due to their structure, each chapter recorded the ability to make changes necessary to reflect the local markets while still affiliating with the national level organization. In places like Australia and Europe, the Bandidos MC became notorious for being involved in drug dealing and trafficking across continents. The unlawful conduct of the Bandidos was not limited to biker gangs and territorial disputes. Their involvement in the field of organized crime was perhaps the primary factor that placed them as a major criminal organization. It was regarded as a criminal organization that engaged its members in drug trafficking as mules, suppliers, and gunmen. By the 1980s, the Bandidos became one of the major dealers of methamphetamine drugs in the southwestern United States and subsequently in Europe and Australia. Methamphetamine was a popular product for the Bandidos because it gave high revenue and was consumed by both young and old. Holders with specialization in distribution usually employed the large network of this club to traffic and sell the drugs across state and international borders. Another major field of operation for the Bandidos was smuggling weapons. Considering the club as being ready for violence, procuring and distributing guns became standard operating procedure. They used them to arm members and sell them like any merchandise to make more money. The second is the ability of the Bandidos to become a reliable source of firepower in the criminal world, because they are a pretty ruthless gang, which made them important not only for the biker community, but also for the criminal world in general. The Bandidos' involvement in organized crime was also characterized by their enforcement of the Code of Omerta and violence. People were required to maintain the club's image, meaning anyone who would turn on them, or anyone deemed dangerous had to be eliminated. This resulted in many instances of violent extrication of individuals within the club and further attacks on the rivals. Possible consequences for lack of loyalty 
or for refusing to obey the club's edicts could involve anything from the prospect of being beaten by members of the club to outright murder. Such actions made certain that its members understood that even if they perceived the organization as being overly dogmatic concerning loyalty, it was going to remain so. In many ways, the Bandidos' involvement in organized crime could be a rather natural progression from their current outlaw status. They considered themselves lawless and were ready to break the law to sustain their standard and guard their rights. At the beginning of the 21st century, the Bandidos became a large and highly organized criminal organization involved in drug trafficking, bootlegging, and contract killing that matched many of the other big crime syndications prevalent in the world. This transformation from a local pro-motorcycle club syndicate to a global criminal organization showed how far they had reached and how far they would reach to cover that. Chapter 2. Rivalries, Criminal Activities, and Operations A brief history of the Bandidos Motorcycle Club shows it continues to confront other OMCs, including the Hells Angels and the Cossacks. Sometimes tension rose high to trigger violent incidents which indeed made this club one of the worst and most aggressive biker gangs in the whole world. There is no doubt that clashes with other outlaw motorcycle clubs were significant events in the Bandidos' existence, as those episodes secured the club's image to the public and other important elements of the organization. They likewise received extensive coverage from media outlets and contributed to increased police sensations towards outlawed bike clubs throughout the United States. The Bandidos and the Hells Angels have been ranked among the world's largest and most influential OMCs. The Bandidos became active across the United States and several other countries in the 1970s and 1980s. They inevitably competed directly with the already dominant Hells Angels. This rivalry arose due to the goal of the two clubs to be the leaders in the biker world, especially in areas where the two clubs were growing, including the southwestern United States, Europe, and Australia. The conflict between the Bandidos and Hells Angels escalated to violence as time passed. In so doing, both the clubs were to engage in several fights due to competition for the rich areas with most authority in drug selling and other criminal activities. Rather than confrontations over territorial rights, tensions extended toward fisticuffs, skirmishes, and occasionally armed conflicts. In the United States, especially in Texas and California, there were several confrontations between the two clubs, and the two sides were very keen to protect their territories. In these wars, the Bandidos were sure to use any means to engage in violent confrontation with the rival group, as they were also known to arm some of their bike riders in a bid to unleash terror and fear on their opponents. This rivalry was not only regional, but also included other European countries. In the 1990s, the Great Nordic Biker War was in Scandinavia, and Bandidos and Hells Angels began the struggle for supremacy in Denmark, Sweden, and Norway. This war was between 1994 and 1997, and all through this period, many were killed and injured on the two sides. It was somehow marked with a lot of violence, bombings, shootouts, and other demonstrators of the power campaign. Throwing grenades and using other barrels proved that these clubs were ready for anything to eliminate their rivals. The need for a better understanding of the roles of civilians, law enforcement, and the military during the war was demonstrated through the consequences of the Nordic Biker War that occurred across the Nordic countries, affecting civilians and challenging authorities' capabilities to stop the violence. These attempts were occasional, but the hate-filled relations between the clubs never ceased. These two groups were firmly set up as bitter opponents by the beginning of the 2000s, and both knew full well that if one of them tried to expand into any of the other's turf, then war would almost certainly break out. This constant state of affairs forced both clubs to be constantly on the alert, in that people within the clubs always had to be prepared to fight members of the other clubs any time they met them. The rivalry turned into the fact that the Bandidos began focusing on their aggressive image as club representatives, contributing to the club's mythology. While the Hells Angels were a long-standing adversary, one of the most infamous conflicts in Bandido history involved a lesser-known but formidable rival, the Cossacks Motorcycle Club. Cossacks, a Texan-based club established in the late 1960s, were much less prominent than the Bandidos, but in many ways, more dangerous. However, as the Cossacks gained power and started to move around and claim territory in Texas, the Bandidos saw this as their backyard. 
The rivalry between the two clubs was evident for years due to rivalry in business, turf, and honor. The Bandidos felt they owned the state of Texas, and any other clubs had to be subject to them. The Cossacks, however, started to interfere with this status, and members began wearing a Texas patch on their vest, a sign that provoked Bandidos. The Bandidos wearing the Texas patch constituted aggression and an attempt at asserting dominance over their rivals' geographical jurisdiction. The violence between the Bandidos and the Cossacks erupted on May 17, 2015, in Waco, Texas. Several members of the two clubs were present in the Twin Peaks restaurant that day, planning to host a meeting of motorcyclist clubs. When the two groups of bikers met during the rally, a social event meant to address issues concerning biker rights and territory, the two clubs clashed. A small conflict in the parking lot led to a real shootout in which people were using firearms, knives, as well as chains. There were nine people killed, 20 people were injured, and nearly 200 people were arrested after the fight. The Waco shootout became a stun by the public and had national and international media coverage. Pictures of people falling in the parking lot and police coming to pin down bikers in unmistakable colors immediately made viewers understand the grim reality of biker gangs activity. The case highlighted how dangerous groups of outlaw motorcycle clubs would act to protect their territory and uphold their honor. This engagement of a significant criminal act from the banditos, and especially one of such a character in which innocent people died, therefore maintained the view of the OMCs as consisting of dangerous and criminal elements that threatened the Lambda citizens. The Waco shootout and other similar episodes contributed to the general view of biker gangs as violent criminal organizations and turned into a persistent association between them and criminality. The high-profile visibility of the hostility between the Banditos and the Hells Angels, and between the Banditos and other clubs, such as the Cossacks, provided the fuel that featured these clubs as more than just a fraternity of motorcycle enthusiasts. Instead, they were viewed as criminal gangs peddling the protection racket able to kill if necessary to maintain their business. This perception produced great effects on the Banditos and other OMCs in criminal organizations. State and federal authorities also started paying increased attention to biker gang organizations and acts against them. The FBI, ATF, and other agencies conducted an investigation of the outlaw bandito's criminal activities for engaging in drug trafficking, weapon smuggling, and other criminal activities. Since the threat posed by OMCs was steadily growing, task forces were created, and clubs' actions became more actively monitored through undercover operations and raids of club participants and clubs. The conflict with the Hells Angels, Cossacks, and other OMCs drastically impacted the Bandito's organizational structure. Both the danger of possible violence and concern for status brought heightened concern about safety within the club. They were constantly alert and ready to protect themselves or their brothers against evil. Such an environment facilitated the formation of a rigid pyramid where members were expected to be loyal and obedient, and the rule of silence was paramount. If they did not do so, it was possible to get severe punishment, including expulsion or even violent action against them. The organization's assertiveness also put great pressure on its leadership. They made long-term choices about boundaries, partaking, and responding to competitors. These decisions were difficult, and the possibility of law enforcement action meant that leadership roles were desired and perilous. Sometimes, internal conflicts regarding responding to rivalries cause some disagreements inside the club, which leads to power struggles. Another problem of this concept is the presence of divisions and power struggles within the club. These rivalries, coupled with the increase in enforcement efforts starting from the late 2000s and through the 2010s, started to affect membership within the Banditos. Some notable incidents include the arrest of upper and above mid-tier leaders. For instance, ex-national president Jeff Pike deeply weakened the club, forcing it to crumble and causing it to be unable to hold small, stable, and united. They lost track of cash through and through and spent a lot of money on legal issues and criminal charges. Besides, the constant threats of retaliations from rival gangs demoralized the members. In addition to providing a glimpse of the gang's activities, the Bandito's wars with the Hells Angels, Cossacks, and other OMCs have become part of their history. These confrontations established the club as one of the most confrontational and enduring motorcycle clubs globally, making their ways part of the outlaw biker lore. However, these rivalries were also the main causes of the club's decline because violence led to a higher police presence and split the club. While the Bandidos remain active in the biker world, 
The era of high-profile territorial feuds and large-scale conflicts has largely faded. The Waco shootout, in particular, marked a turning point as both the public and law enforcement began viewing OMCs as organized crime syndicates rather than rebellious brotherhoods. The legacy of these rivalries serves as a cautionary tale, illustrating the dangers of an unchecked culture of violence and the inevitable consequences of living outside the law. Today, the banditos symbolize rebellion and a stark reminder of the costs of a life dedicated to the outlaw code. Besides violence and rivalry, the Banditos Motorcycle Club is known to be an outlaw motorcycle gang, and this aspect of the gang's operation stems from its participation in organized criminal activities, including dealing with narcotics. As time progressed, the club became involved in criminal activities and became a force to be reckoned with in the world of crime. Their activities have been conducted within the territories of the United States and occasionally at the international level, covering such criminal activities related to narcotics trafficking, weapon smuggling, and money laundering. These criminal endeavors have taken place with the help of a strict system of ranks and file and leadership that was very much inclined to keep a lot of things secret, total loyalty to the gang, and no hesitation in killing anyone who might be a threat to the gang. Controlled drugs have been among the main avenues of income for the Banditos, the mainstay of their criminal activity. As with other OMCs, the Banditos realized the potential of narcotics for revenue at an early stage and thus established dominance over parts of the drug trafficking market in Texas and other nearby states. The activities of this club involve the movement of narcotics in large quantities as well as the retail business of distributing some of these outlawed substances, including methamphetamine, cocaine, as well as marijuana, among its members and other associates. Among all these drugs, methamphetamine stood as the most preferred by the banditos because it was very lucrative, easily synthesized, and could easily be sold in the market. This gang developed networks of distribution of meth that crossed states hence developing reliable sources of income for the organization. In many cases, the chapters worked closely with the Mexican cartel to assume supplies of drugs, making the relation between the cartel and banditos cooperative, thus enhancing the status of the banditos as a major distributors cartel. It not only lets the banditos buy drugs at cheaper prices, but also promotes its control and status within the cartel. However, the day the federal authorities started investigating the club's activities because of drug trafficking, Throughout the years, many Banditos members, among which there were some mid- and senior-ranking officers, were arrested during drug raids that exposed the scale of the gang's drug trafficking activities. In early 2005, the largest ever federal raid against the bike gang Banditos led to the arrest of multiple leaders and associated individuals of the group. Their criminal activities included the distribution of methamphetamine across several states in America. This probe showed that the club financed its activities through the sale of narcotics and revealed the federal government's desire to bring the gang to justice over the drug business. Like most outlaw motorcycle gangs, the banditos engage in drug trafficking as one of their main criminal activities. Another equally famous criminal activity of the banditos is smuggling weapons. Not only is it necessary for the club's internal protection and law enforcement, but it is also a source of extra income. The banditos have been involved in both the possession and sale of firearms to other criminals and other gangs, or anyone willing to pay for ones that could not be traced. Sometimes, the banditos stole weapons or bought them through any other illicit means and made efforts to erase the serial numbers of the purchased guns. They would then proceed to sell such firearms in the black market or make use of them for their employees as a way of arming their people. The weapons covered ordinary guns, powerful pistols, sometimes assault rifles, and, in some cases, the use of military-style firearms. It also cemented the banditos' capacity to prosecute violent operations towards rival gangs. It placed them into a role of providing the means of violent end in the form of firearms to other kinds of criminals. Banditos' weapons importing activities are equal to very significant arrests and court cases. In 2017, an investigation carried out in Fort Worth, Texas, led to the seizure of several guns, some of them belonging to the Banditos gang and including assault rifles and high-capacity magazines. 
These weapons were also reportedly meant for gang business, which showed that the banditos were willing to kit themselves and affiliated people with force to be able to dominate given areas and protect themselves as well. This was one of the weirdest rackets because the gang was willing to go out of their way to defend their business, establishing that they were a very serious force in criminal activity. Members of the Banditos have used money laundering as a way of covering up proceeds receivable from sales of drugs and smuggled weapons. Money was laundered through other legitimate businesses or overcomplicated transactions, so the gang never received attention from law enforcement agencies. Thus, the Banditos have set up front businesses such as bars and motorcycle repair shops, among others, which, apart from being outlets for the fabrication and selling of motorcycles, most importantly, are cash-intensive businesses that the gang uses in money laundering. Some of these legitimate businesses were also used as gathering points for members and tools to assimilate the gang into society, especially in those areas of operation. Sometimes, they would form franchises with local businessmen, meaning they could walk around dressed like genuine businessmen and give their criminal money a more legitimate-looking face. The incurred money was washed in a very complex way so that it would not be easily traced to the source of its income, the gang. An example is one case involving some of California's important Banditos members. Federal agents seized three business establishments run by the gang and found out that the gang was using the business establishments to wash off the money that was produced from the sale of narcotics. This case showed how the main subject, the banditos, could work legally and illegally, proving the club has a super classification and regulates different parts of the economy. This was one endurance in a broad campaign against the banditos, since the federal agencies focused on dismantling their revenues and logistics along with cutting off the financial supply and support for their unlawful operations. With time, law enforcement agencies have made considerable strides in identifying and disrupting bandito operations. Several top members have been prosecuted and convicted of criminal gang-related activities, a record that is beneficial to both the federal and state governments. Even when these arrests often have an impact on the operations of the gang, when some leaders are filled, new leaders emerge to fill the vacant positions of the banditos. One of the most critical arrests occurred in 2006 when then-banditos national president George Wagers was arrested on racketeering and associated multiple charges. The banditos were dealt a serious blow by the arrest of Wagers, an instrumental figure in the growth and execution of the banditos' operations. The case against Wagers revealed that the gang was heavily engaged in organized crime, which consisted of drug smuggling, gun crimes, and violent activities directed towards rival clubs. Another notorious case is the arrest of Jeff Pike, a former national president of the Banditos in 2016. Pike got arrested for several felonies, including conspiracy to commit racketeering and violent crime. This indictment included serious allegations against the banditos, which ran rampant drug operations, extortion, and other illicit activities under Pike's command. The arrest of Pike, along with some other top leaders, generated a vacuum in the club's leadership, which ruptured the chain of command and scope of activities for a time. These prosecutions of the banditos gravitated towards law enforcement's effort to neutralize the leadership of the gang and reduce their space. The federal agencies were strategically in their position, with federal laws like the Racketeer-Influenced and Corrupt Organizations ERICO, Act being employed to eradicate the core leaders and decision-makers of the club. These legal measures reduced the club's expansion rate but highlighted that the club had inner strength since new leaders were ready to take over and expand the operations. Banditos come as no surprise to contain hierarchy. As with most crime organizations, to put it in perspective, we have a national president at the top of the hierarchy, followed by regional and chapter-level officers who coordinate the gang of their respective regions star territories. This form of structure provides for a more effective manner in which the banditos can perform as they have a plan that can be implemented across the states or even countries, with all orders from the top echelon being followed by the different chapters worldwide. Orders are issued vertically within the structure and horizontally, where members conform to a certain conduct or face the consequences. With such a leadership in place, loyalty, silence, and discipline are traits of an ideal member. It is considered treason if members speak about their activities, and violators are dealt harshly. To erase doubts in members' loyalty, their loyalties are further nurtured by oaths and rituals, 
making members feel connected and united as one family. The Banditos promote their identity and intimidate their opponents using patches and symbols, which they also use to designate rank and allegiance. Although the Banditos have survived for decades due to their leadership structure and operational tactics, their organized crime status has resulted in years of litigation, thousands of years of prison sentences, and billions in forfeited proceeds. These arrests of high-ranking members have bled the stability and consistency of the club, leaving it with eras of instability and power struggles inside the organization. Lau says law enforcement's focus on disrupting the Bandito's crime group has also consumed resources and made the club stay out of the spotlight and light-handedly operate. While the Bandito's leadership structure and operational tactics have enabled the gang to endure for decades, their involvement in organized crime has left a trail of legal battles, prison sentences, and financial losses. The frequent arrests of high-ranking members have taken a toll on the club's stability, leading to periods of turmoil and power struggles within the organization. The intense focus of law enforcement on dismantling the Bandito's criminal network has also drained resources and forced the club to operate more covertly to avoid detection. Despite all odds, the Bandidos remains one of the world's best outlaw motorcycle clubs. Their history of criminal endeavor, violent disputes, and systematic structure have all contributed to the definition of this declining, vicious, still power broker in the criminal underbelly of society. The Bandido saga represents the enduring appeal of the outlaw life, but that life continues to take a heavy toll on its rank and file members and leadership. Chapter 3. Law Enforcement, Crackdown, and the Waco Shootout Over a few decades of law enforcement crackdowns, targeting the Bandidos Motorcycle Club's criminal activities and violent reputation, numerous investigations have been conducted against the gang by federal and state agencies in the U.S., including extensive investigations involving undercover officers, surveillance, and multi-agency task forces. This has been complicated because the club has a deeply rooted loyalty structure and a vast network and can always find someone to regroup under new leadership. Nevertheless, sustained disruption of its criminal enterprises through operations against key leadership has produced a series of landmark arrests and convictions that have shaken the Bandidos to its very roots. The first successful operation against the Bandidos occurred in the early 2000s, leading to the arrest of Bandidos National President George Wagers. Designated Operation 22 Green, the investigation was a multi-year, coordinated effort by the FBI, the Drug Enforcement Administration, DEA, and the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, ATF. The operation aimed to cripple the Bandidos' drug operations and spread the group's reach among the ranks of outlaw motorcycle gangs. Wagers was arrested in 2005, along with several other high-ranking members of the Bandidos, on racketeering, extortion, money laundering, and drug distribution charges. Their investigation revealed the club had been operating an interstate meth distribution, along with interstate weapons trafficking and violence against rival gang members. Wagers got prison time, and the federal case against him revealed Bandido's national organized crime network tarnished the gang's image and disrupted its internal workings. Losing such a massive case was a tremendous blow for law enforcement and meant a longtime leader of the Bandidos would be doing time, the first national president of the motorcycle gang to do so. Wager's arrest caused a temporary disruption to the gang, conveying a powerful signal to its members that law enforcement intended to reduce their activities. Ten years later, federal officials hit the Bandidos again, naming Jeff Pike, who replaced Uyghurs as national president. Pike's arrest in 2016 followed a lengthy investigation uncovering violent crimes and other criminal activities carried out by the Bandidos during his time in charge. The indictment against Pike and his second-in-command, John Xavier Portillo, detailed dozens of alarming allegations. Conspiracy to racketeering, including drug trafficking, and organizing assaults against rival motorcycle clubs. According to the Pike and Portillo prosecution, the organization was still active in drug trafficking, the distribution of meth, money laundering, and arms smuggling. Evidence was offered of the violent ways of the Bandidos, including attacks against the Cossacks Motorcycle Club, a dispute that had come to light following the deadly Waco shootout in 2015. 
The indictment states that Pike and Portillo had approved hundreds of violent acts like this and encouraged a culture of violence at Hell's Angels, creating an atmosphere of intimidation and hostility. It was another crushing blow to the leadership of the Bandidos when both Pike and Portillo were found guilty in 2018 and jailed for significant terms. Those were the last of several convictions that ended a chapter in the Bandidos, with the two men seen as crucial in keeping the club united and powerful. In the case of MS-13, much of law enforcement's success stemmed from employing federal racketeering laws that enabled authorities to prosecute leaders for the deeds their members committed maliciously under their command. These crackdowns have worked, in part, because of federal laws targeting organized crime. The RICO Act, Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organizations, which was first passed in 1970, has been an asset for law enforcement in their battle against the banditos and other outlaw motorcycle gangs. RICO criminalizes the process of years of criminal enterprise, and this allows law enforcement to go after the bosses by blaming crimes on them that their underlings committed. It has been a key strategy for persecuting gang leaders who may not personally participate in all the illegalities, but who are responsible for creating a climate of violence and crime among their ranks. The RICO Act has allowed federal authorities to bring charges against the Bandito's leadership. By focusing on the gang's leaders, law enforcement agencies have weakened the Bandito's, creating power vacuums that disrupt the club's activities. RICO allows the government to seize assets and funds derived from illegal activities, destabilizing these gangs and limiting their resources for continued operations. The National Gang Intelligence Center and the Organized Crime Drug Enforcement Task Forces have played important roles in the eradication of outlaw motorcycle clubs. Drug and gang-related crime are the focus of the OCDETF, which includes members of the FBI, ATF, and other law enforcement agencies. The task forces gather intelligence on gang activities, perform undercover work, and support high-profile investigations bringing expertise and resources from multiple agencies to bear on complex cases. In the fight against the Bandidos, undercover work has been used to gather evidence. The Bandidos pose significant risks for undercover agents. Members are known for their loyalty tests and close monitoring of outsiders. There have been successful infiltrations that have provided law enforcement with valuable intel on the gang. An example of an undercover operation involved an ATF agent who spent years undercover within the outlaw motorcycle club scene, infiltrating multiple gangs and gaining the trust of high-ranking members. Intelligence gathered through this operation gave insight into the broader landscape of motorcycle clubs and the alliances and rivalries among them, including the Banditos. Sting operations can be used to gather evidence on Bandito members. These operations often involve controlled drug buys, weapons purchases, or sting operations where law enforcement poses as potential buyers or sellers to catch gang members in the act. At the chapter level, where Bandito's members are often involved in drug distribution and arms sales, these sting operations have led to numerous arrests and convictions. In addition to federal efforts, local and state law enforcement agencies have intensified their focus on the Bandito's especially in states where the gang's presence is robust, such as Texas, New Mexico, and Washington. State task forces work with federal agencies to crack down on gang violence. In Texas, the Texas Department of Public Safety, DPS, has targeted the Bandidos through the Texas Anti-Gang, TAG, centers, which aim to prevent gang-related crime and violence by pooling resources and intelligence from various law enforcement agencies. The TAG centers have carried out multiple operations targeting locations where banditos hang out and suspected drug distribution sites. In certain instances, these centers have managed to disband entire chapters or compel members to move to different locations. For example, following the Waco shootout, the Texas Department of Public Safety initiated a series of raids on banditos clubhouses across the state, seizing firearms, drugs, and cash. These operations disrupted the gang's operations and sent a strong message that local authorities were determined to take a firm stance against their activities. The Bandito's expansion into foreign territories has increased collaboration between law enforcement agencies from different countries. The gang has set up chapters in Australia, Europe, and parts of Southeast Asia, and their activities in these regions have been closely watched by agencies such as Europol and the Australian Federal Police, AFP. 
These organizations have collaborated with the FBI and DEA to monitor the Bandidos' global drug trafficking and weapons smuggling activities, exchanging information and coordinating operations to dismantle their power. In Australia, for example, the Bandidos have been involved in violence with local motorcycle clubs, so the Australian government has brought in strict anti-gang laws. These laws are often referred to as anti-bikey laws and include anti-consorting provisions that prevent gang members from associating with each other in public. Australian police have also conducted high-profile raids on Bandidos clubhouses and seized firearms and other illegal goods. The cooperation between U.S. and Australian law enforcement has allowed both countries to combat the Bandidos' global crime better. Despite this, the Bandidos are still active, adapting to the pressure of law enforcement and moving their activities underground. The takedown of national leaders like Wagers and Pike has certainly hurt the club. However, local chapters operate semi-autonomously, so they can still commit crimes even while the national leadership is in legal trouble. This decentralized model has allowed the Bandidos to stay in the criminal underworld, but the club's power and reach have decreased. Federal and state agencies are still monitoring the Bandidos and other outlaw motorcycle clubs because they are a continuing threat to public safety. The long-term effort to take down the Bandidos shows law enforcement's commitment to reducing their influence and involvement in organized crime. Law enforcement has had some big wins by following the leadership, enforcing federal laws, and working internationally. Still, the battle with the Bandidos and similar clubs is far from over. The 2015 Waco Twin Peaks shootout was a dark day in American outlaw motorcycle club history. On May 17, 2015, the Bandidos and their rival club, the Cossacks, went at it at a Twin Peaks restaurant in Waco, Texas. What started as a gathering of various motorcycle clubs turned into a violent showdown, resulting in nine deaths, 18 injuries, and over 170 arrests. The public was shocked and it got national attention and showed the violent culture of outlaw biker gangs and made people focus on the criminal activity and rivalries that define these clubs. Chapter 4 Internal Struggles, Leadership Turmoil, and Downfall With law enforcement pressure and arrests piling up and members getting locked up, the Bandidos Motorcycle Club was in turmoil. The club was in disarray and the leadership was in conflict, with power vacuums and members turning informants. All this fractured the club's core, making it hard for them to function and control their chapters in the U.S. and internationally. The arrest and conviction of high-ranking members, including former National President George Uyghurs in the early 2000s and Jeff Pike in 2018, was a big blow to the Bandidos. Uyghurs' arrest on charges of drug trafficking, extortion, and witness tampering was one of the first big indictments to shake the club to its core. With a high-profile leader behind bars, the Bandidos needed to regroup fast. Internal conflicts arose over who would fill Wager's shoes and how the club would continue to operate with all the legal challenges. Later, Jeff Pike and VP John Portillo got arrested, further destabilizing the club. Pike and Portillo were accused of ordering violence, including murder and assault, to keep control and dominance over the Bandidos' territory in Texas. These high-level arrests left a power vacuum and caused infighting among the remaining members. Many longtime members who had followed the code under established leadership were questioning the club's direction. As loyalty to leadership waned, ambitious members saw an opportunity to move up, and that caused infighting and fractured loyalty within the club. With key leaders arrested, the Bandidos had a big problem with a unified command structure. Factionalism started to surface as members fought for control of the club. Some factions wanted to change the strategy and avoid the violence that had brought so much heat from law enforcement. Others wanted to return to the old ways that made the Bandidos dominant. This split caused tension. Some chapters started to break away from the traditional Bandidos philosophy and start new leadership, while others remained loyal to the original mission and methods. The internal squabbles didn't just weaken the Bandidos' ability to enforce their rule. They also made it hard for the club to present a united front to potential new members and allied clubs. As the word spread about the leadership disputes, trust in the Bandidos' stability decreased and the club became vulnerable to challenges from other gangs. This division within the club meant it couldn't expand and its influence in areas where it once was uncontested. 
And to top it all off, more and more members were facing long prison sentences or harsh penalties and were choosing to cooperate with the cops. These members became informants and gave prosecutors valuable information on the Bandidos' operations, structure, and illegal activities. This betrayal within the club meant more arrests, and the trust and loyalty that had always been part of the club's code was broken. Take the cases against Jeff Pike and John Portillo, for example. Several ex-Bandidos took the stand and spilled the beans on the club's pecking order and illegal doings. Their stories laid bare what went on behind closed doors. This gave the cops what they needed to show the Bandidos for what they were, a bunch of crooks. As a result, members who got caught faced tougher punishments. These big-name trials caught the public's eye and fired law enforcement to go after other club members similarly. The Bandidos were still around and started to worry more about getting stabbed in the back. This led to everyone in the gang being suspicious of each other. Members began to doubt who they could trust. And things got tense as the bosses tried to figure out if any of their own were talking to the cops. This change weakened the close ties that strengthened the club, since trust became hard to come by within the group. The Bandidos, who were known for keeping quiet and sticking together, now faced the fact that some of their own had decided to team up with the law instead of staying loyal to the gang. The arrests of leaders, fights between factions, and betrayals joined forces to hurt the Bandidos' ability to work well. Without clear bosses or a shared plan, groups across the country started to do their own thing, which made the gang even less united. Some groups cut back on their actions, worried about getting the cops' attention. Others took charge themselves, doing stuff that used to be planned and watched by the top dogs. This loss of control from the center didn't just make it harder for the Bandidos to keep everyone in line. It also made it tough for them to pull off big crimes together. The splintering effect caused the Bandidos to lose control over areas they once ruled. In some places, other gangs moved in on Bandidos' turf, taking advantage of the gang's inner chaos and weak grip. This led the Bandidos to give up ground to rivals, which hurt their status among outlaw motorcycle gangs even more. The Bandidos Motorcycle Club used to be a big player in the world of outlaw bikers, but its power has taken a hit in recent years. This decline stems from increased heat from global cops who have gone after the gang's work overseas. Places like Australia and Germany have seen big crackdowns on the Bandidos, which has put key members behind bars and shrunk their footprint in these areas. The Bandidos Motorcycle Club had a strong presence in Australia, particularly in states such as Queensland and New South Wales. However, outlaw motorcycle clubs have been the broader target of aggressive law enforcement actions. Specialized anti-organized crime teams were set up to fight against criminal activities related to those clubs. Some high-profile law enforcement actions, like the recently announced Operation Ironside, brought down many chapters of Bandidos by arresting several of their top men, with some key leaders in custody and legislation introduced to counter gang-related activities. The operational capacity and reach of Bandidos have effectively been curtailed within the region. In Germany, for example, the Bandidos were, at one point, the largest outlaw motorcycle gangs. Still, a wave of police crackdowns has seriously affected them regarding organizational structure and sustaining operations. A priority for German law enforcement authorities has been to dismantle the criminal enterprises associated with Bandidos, resulting in several convictions for drug trafficking, extortion, and violence. The legal assault, combined with well-informed law enforcement units, made the environment intensely uncomfortable for the Bandidos to operate. Therefore, they retreated and downsized their activity in the country. The international legal environment has evolved into a maze for the Bandidos. Developments such as extradition treaties, information exchange agreements, and cooperative actions of law enforcement agencies in different countries have implied that the gang has a smaller chance of acting as a transnational organization. The thriving network of alliances and mutual support the Bandidos have been depending on now is no longer a reality due to the increased participation of law enforcement agencies that are targeting gang members all over the world. Law enforcement has disrupted the Bandidos' scheme of operating internationally due to collaborative efforts, and thus, it has been experiencing a reduced presence in key markets. However, even dusted by the massive setbacks, the Bandidos will continue to be a force in American and international biker culture. Its tales fostered the ethos and morality of the outlaw motorcycle gang, lending credence to brotherhood, defiance, 
and opposition to conformity for bikers still today. Their colors and symbols remain one of the most recognizable images in motorcycle clubs and the aesthetic and ethos of motorcyclists worldwide. The Banditos are in the U.S. today, but not to the same extent as in their glory days. Chapters are a mixed bag, however, and their numbers and power have diminished thanks to splintering fights from within and heavy law enforcement scrutiny from without. Ongoing troubles of the gang in terms of unity and functionality have left a power vacuum, helping other outlaw clubs rise to power. With the decline of this influence by the Banditos, though, others have come in to fill the gap, including the Mongols and the outlaws. Now, these gangs are fighting for supremacy over areas once held by the Banditos, a clear indication of a change of guard, so to speak, in the outlaw motorcycle culture. Although the Banditos are no longer the powerful force they once were, the history and the cultural relevance they've generated among the biker crowd are irrefutable. Whether the Banditos can restore their former stature or continue to dwindle amid a fresh crop of outlaw motorcycle entrants is an open question.